This afternoon, it's a pleasure to have Professor Anne Marie uh, Belluni return to the World Affairs Council this afternoon to talk to us about the Syrian refugee crisis. Some may recall that uh, she was our guest several years ago and spoke to us about the political situation in Lebanon at the time. She's an associate of the National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School, where she teaches courses on comparative politics in the Middle East, the history, culture, and politics of Islam, and refugee issues. Uh, Professor Beyluni has lived in Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, and traveled extensively in the Middle East. She's fluent in Arabic. Her recent work includes publications on militia governments in the Lebanese Civil War, Hezbollah's media messages, and authority in ungoverned spaces. Professor Beyluni earned her PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley. She has been a recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, including Fulbright, Social Science Research Council, and the Mellon Foundation, among others. And it was a, a treat to be able to talk to her at the table today. I'm really looking forward to this. Please join us in welcoming Professor Bingham. So thank you for inviting me to talk on this topic. I will promise you it will be informative, but I cannot promise you it will be uplifting. It will not. It's still a crisis. Syrian refugee crisis is going on in its eighth year, and it is not seeing shown any signs of abating anytime soon. And it pervades our, our world today. There's all kinds of questions about populism, nationalism, are the refugees dangerous? Is ISIS going and invading and trying to get resettled amongst these refugees in the United States? And why on earth are people taking selfies when they arrive in Greece? So I'm going to talk about these issues and others. The Syrian refugee crisis is the largest humanitarian crisis of our time. It's overwhelming. In fact, it's so overwhelming that we've become desensitized to the numbers. 25% of the world's refugees are Syrian. And hardly any have been resettled to third countries. There's now about 6 to 7 million refugees. That's not including people who are either resettled or have received asylum in Europe or other countries. We hear a lot about the fear of refugees in the U.S. and Europe, the anti-immigrant and xenophobic feelings that have arisen, presumably in response, and the fear that these refugees of a different culture are going to overwhelm European and Western culture. There's a couple problems with this. First, the numbers of refugees in the West or trying to get to the West are very, very, very small. And they pale in comparison with what the developing world is dealing with. Second, the Western countries have developed economies, infrastructures, adequate water, adequate electricity, police forces, security institutions in place to deal with influx. The amount of Syrians that would have been accepted and were accepted before uh, this recent administration, 80,000 in the United States, is not even 1% of the U.S. It's about a 50th of 1%. It's a very tiny, tiny number. The numbers are larger for Germany, but still 1%. There's about a million refugees in Germany that has the most of Europe. About two-thirds of them are Syrian. And for Germany's population, that's about 1%. And a large majority of those have found jobs. In fact, Germany knew what it was doing when it ignored Shenzhen rules by inviting the Syrian refugees. Because Germany has few births and lots of older people who are drawing pensions, and they needed literally to reproduce their economy. They needed workers. 
to pay into the system. Early on, Germany had advertised and tried to draw the Syrian refugees who were doctors. And they did. They got them very early, trained them, and now they're functioning doctors because they needed doctors in rural areas. And they filled that need in their system. So here I want to discuss the idea that these are Facebook refugees or that they're not really suffering because we see them taking selfies in Greece when they arrive. Not so much anymore, but 2015 was the height of the migration to Europe. And at that time, people said, well, they look rich and they care about their cell phones more than they care about food. And so they can't be suffering. First, refugees is not an economic condition. You can be rich, you can be poor. It's a physical survival condition. What they need sometimes is money, but sometimes is not. Sometimes they need physical safety that their country cannot provide. And there's also a mistaken role of cell phones in migration. Cell phones and smartphones have become the way to get all other goods. Refugees care more about their cell phone than their next meal because the next meal will come and go. The cell phone will get them the next meal and the next weeks of meals. It will get them jobs. It will get them housing. It will tell them how to go on their route. The Syrian refugees are unique and the first in history to use apps on cell phones to navigate the migration route, often without human smugglers. Human smugglers typically take money from refugees or would-be migrants up front. They take the entire thing up front, and you hope that they get you to where you want to go. You put your faith in their sort of goodwill, which is often non-existent. Syrians instead have navigated the route by themselves. They use maps, they use Twitter, they use WhatsApp, they use Facebook, they use social groups on the web to connect. Uh, they even use them, the ones that go farther along in the route, signal to the ones uh, behind. There's some uh, thieves on the road at this particular point, and they can use GPS to figure out what point that is. But probably the most interesting and life-saving use of apps for the refugees is for human smuggling. When they do use a smuggler, because often people need someone to connect them. They connect them through the different points of the route. They use money transfer sites on the quasi-dark web to transfer money little portions at a time when they arrive at their next destination. So instead of transferring it all at once and losing all leverage, they signal this app to transfer the third party when they have arrived. Those selfies that you saw, in many cases, were proof of life. They were proof that the person had arrived and the smuggler could now get paid. So there's a complete misunderstanding of how these apps really do help. Still, most Syrians did not flee to Europe. About one million, we estimate. Maybe more, it keeps going up and down the numbers. Most fled to the surrounding states, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, and on foot. These are the poorest. The ones that went to Germany are middle class, they have skills, they have an ability to make it in Europe. The ones on foot flee with whatever they have. Turkey received the most numerically. 3.7 million by now are in Turkey. But the Turkish population is 80 million. So still, this is still just a few percent. Lebanon and Jordan, fellow Arab countries, have received the most per their 
population numbers. There's probably about a million and a half Syrians at least, because many don't register, in Lebanon. The country's population is only 4.5 million. That's over a quarter, we estimate. Because of the difficulties in registering and the Lebanese government stopped the UN from registering refugees at a certain point. Jordan has six, over 600,000, probably the number is closer to a million. They represent 10% of Jordan's population. And these countries are not economically developed like Europe or Turkey, even for that matter. They do not have infrastructures that can get everybody water or electricity or take out the trash or the sewage. And these types of things have been further stressed by the Syrians. And I should probably use this, which I have not. Uh, just some migrant routes to Europe. Arrivals and deaths at sea. The darker red areas are where Syrians fled first, the nearby areas. So northern Jordan, southern Turkey, eastern Lebanon, but more they, they went throughout Lebanon, north, east, and they're everywhere. So where do they live? These are some of the numbers. 3.7 and Turkey is the largest. Turkey established refugee camps on the border. Very nice refugee camps, actually, quite model ones. But still, the refugee camps with nothing to do. So people sit around all day. And Syrians are now uh, infamous for not wanting to sit around without work. So they don't stay in refugee camps. Between 85 to 90 percent of Syrians choose to live in the cities and towns and work illegally because work is not allowed. This is Lebanon. The numbers stopped counting in 2015 because Lebanon, the Lebanese government, told the UN to stop registering. So we don't know how many there are. The Lebanese government did that because of popular opinion. They're everywhere. They're all throughout, throughout the country. And despite the fact that Lebanon and Jordan are fellow Arab countries with very similar languages, customs, culture, some of the same families, actually. Relatives on either side, intermarriages. We have seen huge, huge response of hostility, animosity, and violence against Syrians. The idea that it's a different culture that makes people hate refugees or fear them and causes a nationalist reaction may or may not be true, but it's not true in this case because this is a similar culture and the reaction is quite violent. Lebanon forbid refugee camps because of their history with the Palestinians. Palestinian camps are still there. What is it now? 70 years later. And they still cause a problem for the military. So they forbid them. So the response is that Syrians live in informal tented settlements. These are not run by the UN. They're not paid for by the UN. The UN has no ability to put in sewage systems or electricity or clean water. So they're basically squatter settlements. And these are throughout, especially Lebanon. They're not exactly great places to live. Any refugees with money rented apartments. <coughs> 
they live in substandard housing, garages, warehouses, things like that, which often also don't have running water, electricity, or sewage. Just some more pictures. This is some that I've been to. Uh, the informal tented settlements became a problem in January when Lebanon had quite a bad winter storm. And they received a lot of snow and uh, at least six uh, refugee babies died of froze to death. This is the Zaatabi refugee camp in Jordan. Jordan did want refugees to stay in camps. They did not want refugees to affect their domestic labor. They didn't want them thinking that they could intermarry and stay because they've already had the Palestinians before and the Iraqis. So Zaghdadi was established on very uh, desolate land in the north. But it's still, this is the picture you see when you Google Syrian camp. And it's the photo opportunity for showing how overwhelmed these countries are. But this is not the face of Syrian refugees. Most do not live in Zaatari. Over 85% do not live there. They live in the cities and towns. But it's hard to get a good photo opportunity of a city and town. How, how you can't distinguish, right? So this becomes the place that all of our government officials go to to take a photo opportunity and where you go to distribute things and how the countries beg for money. So living amongst the populace, they don't suffer the ills of camp life. So they don't get bored and be depressed with nothing to do. But on the flip side, what they do do is they stress the local economy. They work illegally, and they affect the infrastructure, education. Numbers of kids at schools in some of these areas doubled. Water. Countries are already having a hard time providing water. Jordan is one of the most water-scarce countries in the world. And at times in the last few years, it has run out of water. It's particularly areas near the refugee camps have run out of water. Trash and sewage systems. Lebanon's sewage system and trash are a whole other story because they do not function. But the Syrians added to it. So you're adding 30% trash also in areas that don't have any means to dispose of human waste or normal trash. Electricity systems. Lebanon cannot provide 24-7 electricity. It couldn't before, and now it has even less electricity. So people have to hook up to generators and other grids, and those cost far, far, far more. Of course, if you're poor, you can't afford that. Housing, rental prices went up. They doubled. In some cases, northern Jordan, landlords kicked out Jordanians from their apartments in order to rent to Syrians. Because Syrians had just come, they had some money and savings, Everyone thought the war was going to end soon. They thought the U.S. was going to come in and end the war. Then by the time ISIS showed up, everyone said, mm, the war is not going to end anytime soon. And they got very, very sick of all of these refugees. Healthcare systems. Reports that the lines are, are very, very long for nationals now. Syrians are overwhelming the healthcare system. The job market. Syrians are preferred often in these countries because they work longer hours. They're working illegally, so they work for lower pay. And they have, they are locally known as having a very good work ethic. So in many cases, they are hired over locals. We know this is what people believe. The data does not bear out that Lebanese and Jordanians have suffered economically because of Syrians. 
But we also know that data and economic facts are one thing, and what people choose to believe is completely different. Child labor. One of the facts of refugee situations is that children often work. It's less risky for children to work if they're caught, it's believed that they won't go to prison or be deported, whereas if the, the man, head of the family, is caught working, he will often be deported or sent to prison. And then not only will the family be deprived of a wage earner, they're also deprived of security, because now it's a female-headed house with only children, and living in informal tented settlements, they are vulnerable to all kinds of violence with no one to defend them. Going to school is already difficult for children, refugee children, due to transportation problems, animosity at school, Syrian refugees get beaten up. The need to earn money just pushes that. Very young children work in the fields in Lebanon, and many of the informal tented settlements are located right next to agricultural lands in order to take advantage of the refugee labor. So I mentioned the increase in xenophobia and right-wing groups. These are banners proclaiming that Syrians are banned from being on the streets at night. They're curfews on Syrians. They're technically not legal, but the municipalities do them. This is in Lebanon. They do them because people fear the Syrians. There's so many of them. They don't know them. They think they're very different. The problem is you can't go out even if you have a job. You can't leave if you're a Syrian. If you're caught in the streets, they will beat you up, put you in prison. If you have a health emergency, don't have one in the evening until, wait till 6 or 7 a.m. And people have been mistaken for Syrians and beaten up Lebanese. This is the, the pattern with animosity. So why all the animosity? One reason is just the sheer numbers. There are just too many. And the countries are not capable of handling them. And it comes on top of other waves of refugees. These countries have had to deal with the Palestinians, then the Iraqis, now the Syrians, and probably the Yemeni are coming next. Jordan also restricted movements, but that it did that on a national level and has returned many Syrians. Currently, uh, this is difficult to see, but this is a satellite image of the berms in Jordan. Berms are sand mounds on either side of the border, and Jordanian government is keeping would-be Syrian refugees in these areas. They won't let them in the country, and they're keeping them there. They're also keeping out aid groups, so aid groups do not have a chance to get in and help people there. Right now, all the exits from Syria have been closed. The countries are too overwhelmed. They say we just have too many people and we're not letting any more in. So while the war is still going on, there is no appetite for the surrounding countries to have any more people. So what's the potential solution? Will the Syrians go home? We keep seeing uh, ISIS is winding down. The UN recognizes three solutions to ref refugee problems. One is repatriation, going back to your home country. The other, local integration, just staying where you are and intermarrying and staying there. Well, we've got a lot of animosity, so that's not going to be the solution for the bulk of Syria. Some of them, yes, will stay. But four million Syrians in Turkey is probably is not going to be allowed. And the last one is resettlement. 
Resettlement is finding a home in a third country. And this is what the U.S. stopped doing. Uh, Canada has taken up slack, but we were the largest resettler of Western countries. It comes from a system of UN responsibility sharing for refugees, but still only accounts for a maximum of 1% of all refugees. It's the most vulnerable, those that are, have been victims of torture, those that are likely to continue being victims and be targeted in the host country, Jordan, Lebanon, or Turkey, those are the people that become eligible to be resettled. Given the international climate, this is not going to happen for many. There's a lot of discussion about resettling in this country, and the debate has focused on ISIS and whether ISIS is trying to resettle refugees through our system, kind of sneak them in there, and refugees might be a threat. This is very far from true. In the past 14 years, the U.S. has accepted over 750,000 refugees. None have been charged with domestic terrorism. Two were charged in connection with a potential plot. But again, out of 750,000, and the plot never happened. The U.S. has the most stringent, time-consuming, and thorough vetting process of any country in the world. In fact, it's the most. If the UN needs to resettle someone quickly, the humanitarian aid agencies and the UN don't go to the US, ever. Because it takes at least two years to resettle someone. So if it's a child that needs to be resettled immediately, a girl who has been raped, who is probably going to be killed, they turn to other countries. In the US process, only the squeakiest of the squeaky clean get through. The background investigations and checks can take years, and every agency has to sign off and do their own checks. The chances of being resettled as a refugee, it's pretty much the chance of winning the lottery. So the idea that ISIS would try to sneak somebody in there and go through years of vetting process before they finally got into the U.S., doesn't make sense compared with the idea that they could just pay a few border guards and slip them over the border somewhere. That's much more likely to happen. But increasingly they don't even do that. They recruit domestically. So they find people who are discontented locally, who are already here, usually not refugees actually, or even close to it, and they become activated. So Islamists and others have an interest in portraying Syrians as threatening. It's not just the nationalistic populists that want to that want everyone to think that Syrians are threatening and a danger to your culture. The Islamists have an interest in this. If the West accepts Muslims and refugees in their time of trouble, it disproves Islamism's core ideology that Muslims and Christians cannot coexist. Plus, if you don't accept any refugees, it only increases anger at the West for ignoring this very real human tragedy and serves the causes of radical Islamism. Local integration, probably some will stay. Many Syrians have started businesses, particularly in Turkey and Jordan. Lebanon, it's much more difficult due to the atmosphere. Businesses that were started have been closed down. Many intermarry. We have child brides. This happens with all refugee situations, practically. It's an economic decision 
to marry a girl early. It's much more profitable for the girl and her family than the prospect of going staying in school and still not finding a job or still not getting money. So it's, it's seen as an economic decision. So some will stay, but the bulk, the world is hoping that they repatriate. And it's used, repatriation is used, okay, well let's just go back. It's not so simple. Very few have gone back and many areas are probably safe. So why? Why haven't they gone back? First, there's nothing for them to return to. It's been bombed out. There's no jobs. There's no schools. There's no roads. And someone else is living in their house, if their house still exists. We know from war situations that people move around a lot. The average moves a Syrian uh, undertakes before leaving the country is six. So they move from area to area and they live in somebody else's house. Kicking those people out is very difficult because there's no justice system in the country that you can go to. Plus those people don't have any place to go themselves. Lebanon had a civil war 30 years ago and they still have not fixed these displacement problems where people were living in other people's houses. So property rights are a problem. And work. How did you earn money? All of the industry is destroyed. <laughs> Most people say that going back depends on security, ISIS no longer working there, and some type of an ability to support themselves economically. But they left for a reason in the first place. Many of these are on the wrong side of the Assad government. And if he stays in power, we do know some have returned and been disappeared. Many are very, very afraid that they will go back just to go to prison or be killed. Refugees, when they go home, under the best of all circumstances, their view is different from the local people. The local people who stayed during the war view the refugees coming back as those that cut and ran. Even if their houses were bombed and they had no choice, there's still this difference of opinion. This is one reason Iraqi refugees, many have not gone back. Or they settle in different areas. Because the Iraqis that stayed view them very differently and they're uh, discriminated against them. Some refugees don't have a choice. They're going to have to go back. Because although it's against international law, some countries are forcing refugees to return. Lebanon has negotiated a deal with a town on its border that was causing a lot of problems. You might have heard of Arsal. The Islamist militants took over this town and were battling the Lebanese military and Lebanese police, and then Hezbollah also. cutting off heads, uh, kidnapping police, and things like that. And this was a huge refugee area. So anyone in that town that was seen as supporting the Islamist group was put on buses and sent back to Syria when the fighting finally ended. Within a joint operation between the Lebanese military, Hezbollah, and beside behind-the-scenes support from the U.S who negotiated it all. In order for a successful return, we know that people need to have some kind of link to their home country. They need investment from international organizations. Otherwise, when they go home, it is as if they're starting from scratch. If they go home in large numbers, whether they're forced to go home or whether they should choose. If they go home in large numbers, the evidence shows that they will restart the conflict. Because they will overwhelm the, the country 
And the only security agencies there are the former militias and the Assad government that does not have full control over the country. They overwhelm the situation as it is, and they strain the, again, non-existent resources. Trash, electricity, water, housing, jobs. And armed actors tend to fill in the gaps. So we usually get conflicts. So, this is very, very enlightening, very, very uplifting, I can see. But the Syrians who made it to Europe are in the best situation. They'll, most of them will probably stay. Others around are threatened with repatriation. They're viewed as causing economic problems. Similar to how many people view Mexicans or Hispanics in this country. In this case, they have stressed the infrastructure. The jobs is not very clear. But they're still blamed for the economies, the bad economies these countries are going through, and accused of taking the jobs. The international human rights organizations are responding with lots and lots of aid and paying Jordan and Lebanon to keep the refugees. So they're essentially saying, keep them there, let them work, and we will give you tons and tons of money. And they're doing this out of a fear that those Syrians will move onward to Europe. It's not out of the goodness of their hearts. The problem with this is that a lot of the aid is going to the, the governments. It's not going to the Syrians. So the governments say, okay, we won't kick them out. It's almost, it's a bribe to keep the Syrians there. But we still have Syrians dying because of lack of blankets, lack of electricity and heat, not enough water, dysentery for dirty water, lack of health care. The aid still has not gone where it's needed. That's it, thank you. Sorry, I could be more uplifted. It's not just me. I think I have some more. Uh, repatri these are repatriation numbers. Um, and this, if, uh, if you're interested, you can Google Choose Your Own Escape Route. And it's a fun game uh, the BBC put up where you pick a gender and then you pick how you're going to travel and they give you all these options. And you, most people that do this find they have to throw one of the family members overboard in order to make it to Europe. It's, it shows some of the very difficult circumstances that Syrians have to go through to get out. Okay, uh, I'll do the Van White then here. We'll take uh, questions from the audience and I'll try to uh, maneuver around. So I'll start over here. First question. What was the goal of the governments of Lebanon and Jordan and Turkey before the aid was given? What was the incentive for them to accept any refugees at all? So we, they were still getting aid, just not as much and not directly to the governments. The incentive right in the beginning was everyone felt sorry for the Syrians. There was empathy for the Syrians for the first two years. After that, the numbers started to really overwhelm the countries. And then they started to kick them out. At that point, the international organizations realized that they had to start helping domestic people also, citizens, along with the Syrian refugees, in order to prevent conflict. And they did start doing that. They started giving more money to the countries 
but still it wasn't on the, the level that it is now. Now it's being elevated to a solution. Thank you, great talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could clarify for us both the, uh, the definition and the process and the current situation among asylum seekers, refugees, and illegal immigrants who just sneak across the border without being classified as anything. Okay, so a refugee is a person outside their country that is fleeing persecution or conflict or a situation that involves threats to their life. You could be a refugee without being recognized as a refugee in those countries. And what you are de facto is you are an asylum seeker. You are looking for asylum, which is the freedom to not be deported. But re achieving refugee status is a more permanent asylum than a temporary asylum for WikiLeaks founders or things. They get asylum, they don't get sent out, but you can withdraw that at any point. If you're termed a refugee, by international law, you are not supposed to be sent back until the country is safe and there is a closure. Refugees do not need to come into a country legally. It is their right to flee for their lives any way they can. They do not need to have proper documents, nothing. So we, we do not classify refugees as illegal. Migrants is the large category of anybody, anybody going, anybody traveling. You could be traveling for economic reasons, we call those economic migrants, or because you're fleeing war. Those are two different things. They often are mixed up together because people are, they went to Germany to find jobs and they were fleeing wars, so it, it's, a, it's a little fuzzier. But if there's no war or mass conflict, mass societal conflict, gang violence, etc., and you go somewhere else to look for a job, that's an economic migrant. However you go, illegally or legally, you can go either legally or illegally. Okay, I'm moving toward this side, so... A question about Jordan. Uh, to what extent, because of the Syrian refugee crisis, the number of Palestinians and then the Iraqis, is King Abdullah II's uh, uh, power, authority, and rule in jeopardy? And I know that there have been a number of moves that uh, King Abdullah II has made because of pressures put on him. And I'm wondering, you know, what kind of degree of stability does the Jordanian, you know, Hashemai kingdom have given you know, the, the Jordanian refugee crisis? That's a great question. I'm actually writing on that right now. <laughs> uh, so the refugee crisis has articulated. It has gone from affecting primary resources and infrastructure, and people protested against that. And they protested directly to the government and demanded things of the government. For the first time in 2013, we had people telling the king off. So uh, in northern Jer Jordan, near, uh, near the biggest refugee camps, Aftani, Villages ran out of water in 2013. And they took up arms and protested. The king came to the area and promised them all water by tankers. Said, we'll get you, you know, tanks of water. And they said, no. We want water to our house like normal people. And the king had to say yes. So, this process, this is in a nutshell, that little process has spiraled. And it has spiraled to the point where we have massive demonstrations now in Jordan that started fundamentally over economic issues, crisis mobilizing, we'd call it, and have become increasingly organized, broad. Now they're, they're, they're taking over most of the country. 
I don't know if you have been following, but the last few days, there are Jordanians walking from Aqaba, which is in the far south, to Amman, walking. This is partially an effect of the presence of the Syrians. First, the idea of walking as a demonstration and going somewhere never existed before. That was not a protest type thing. This is what refugees do. They walk to flee, to, to get help. Um, second, the idea of the economy being bad, people are blaming on the government. People are not blaming it on the Syrians. They, they're angry at the Syrians, yes. They're angry, they say, oh, if you weren't here, you know, it'd be better. But they put responsibility for changing it on the government. And they're viewing increasingly the government is failing in that, despite billions of, of dollars coming in. And it's publicized every week. You see something in the Jordanian papers about how much Japan or Australia or Germany is giving to Jordan to fix the country. And people are saying, what are you doing with that money? We aren't getting it. And then the IMF comes in and loans money. And as a result of this loan, they want Jordan to do certain things. The IMF and World Bank have very clear ideas what they want, right? Ah, uh, you have to cut these subsidies. Forget, forget maximum prices of bread and letting poor people eat bread properly. No, no, no. You have to cut that. You have to increase taxes. So those moves, in order to get loans, Ostensibly to deal with the refugee crisis, Jordan is having to impose taxation that it never has before, income taxation, on more and more groups. Increased taxes on all kinds of goods, value-added taxes, the sneaky ones that you can just put in and you never know whether a grocer is raising the price even more. Right? But when we hear about a lack, of, uh, a lack of oil coming from the Middle East, all of a sudden our oil prices or gas prices the next minute go up by $2 or something. And we know that they're taking advantage of the crisis in order to get more from us and just blame it on the crisis in the Middle East. This is the same type of taxes. So you increase by... Lebanon had a large protest over a value-added tax increase of 1% because they knew the grocers were going to in for increase more. So now your flour is it's not just 1% more, it is definitely at least 50 cents more. So this has, and they've been criticizing corruption at the highest levels. The king's wife is not popular. She is viewed as corrupt, uh, Palestinian, so on the wrong side of the Jordanian-Palestinian divide. And there are some events that have happened, or people believe have happened. Lots of corruption in the royal family. And people are targeting corruption now and starting to talk about the king as responsible. So this has spiraled. This is a real problem right now. I'm wondering if you could give us uh, a, a, a quick overview of how we're doing as a planet in terms of refugees over the last uh, many years. Is this a trend? Are, worldwide, are, are refugee numbers increasing, oh, increasing, or maintaining? Absolutely. Refugee numbers are just going to go up. Uh, because of more wars? are happening. Yemen, we're just waiting for a, an outflow of Yemeni refugees. And there there's a legitimate, legitimate gripe against the United States for helping Saudi Arabia in that, uh, in that war. Desertification, increasing desert. Particularly Africa is being hit first by desertification and then the Middle East. The Syrian revolution itself the Syrian civil war came on the heels of about eight years of the worst drought that they had. And people moved from the towns to the cities 
where they couldn't find work because there were already Iraqi refugees there that had never gone home. Right? So these things just spiral. Plus, we're getting flooded. There are islands that will no longer exist in the next few years. At least within 20 years, at least one island will go away. Those people have to go somewhere. Now, they're not refugees of war, but they have no other ability to sustain themselves, so they're going to have to move. They don't have a choice whether to become an illegal immigrant or not. So we're going to get people on the move. The desert in Africa is increasing at an alarming rate. And it just feeds more and more conflicts as people move in. The countries are unable to deal with it. It's all in the developing world. And these countries don't have the infrastructures to handle it. As a world, in dealing with accepting refugees proactively, we are absolutely failing. We need to take a 20, 30 year view of what's going to happen and when people are going to move. And we're not. Instead, the world's countries are just shutting themselves down. Instead of saying, essentially what Germany did, we need people, we need babies, we are not having enough babies. And we can use some in certain areas, why don't we target the areas that we need? Makes sense. The refugees won't mind, they, they just want to get out. Refugees famously will work uh, anywhere. I met a man in Istanbul who was serving sweets, and he's a lawyer from Syria. They'll work in any way, I don't care as long as my kids are safe, right? This is that sentiment. And Turkey put all kinds of rules on them. Okay, your kids have to learn Turkish. Your kids have to go to Turkey's Turkish schools. And the Syrians are fine, okay? As long as they're safe, we're okay with that. We're okay with these requirements. But we're not looking proactively. We're not trying to create new types of opportunities and see how we can use this. We're just going, no, 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 no. It's not happening. But it's not going to stop. The Syrians are the first wave. Information technology has made it easier to move. And as a result of the example of the Syrians, more people left Africa thinking that they could get to Europe also. But they didn't have the technological skills to negotiate the journey themselves. So they used human smugglers. Many of them turned into being trafficked. The difference between smuggling, smuggling is when you want to go. Trafficking is when it's against your will. So at certain points, they turned into being trafficked. And the traffickers turned into, trafficker smugglers turned into organized crime networks. Became very, very powerful because once, once you start trafficking or smuggling in humans, there's no good on this planet that can produce as much profit. Even drugs don't produce as much profit as human beings moving. So once they start have moved into human beings moving, they have a hard time moving into anything else. You have to maintain these networks. And they have intense networks. You need safe houses to keep people. You need landlords on your side. You need police. You need customs uh, agents to bribe. You, it, we, we know how sophisticated they've gotten because they actually got together and gave up one of their smuggling routes so that Morocco could show the EU that it was being tough on smuggling. And then two hours later, a bunch of other boats left from other places. So we know this was all coordinated. So this is a byproduct. And this is, uh, this is a serious threat. It's just going to increase. Another question over here. We, I think, can agree we're not going to get much help out of the Trump administration in dealing with these problems. But would you think there's much hope that we can do something in, say, a, a more friendly administration? Or is this is just politically too difficult? No, there's a lot that can be done. If the world's leaders just realize that this is going to happen, so it's how you want to manage it. Do you want to manage it proactively and take advantage of this labor? Or do you want to just bury your head in and fuel right-wing movements. 
We know right-wing movements take elite assistance. They don't just happen overnight. They can, but elites can also calm them. We have some data on what it takes to spur animosity. And incentives for election, incentives for political parties are a huge part of that. There are many things that can be done to organize the process and figure out, okay, first let's try not to incentivize war by invading anybody or encouraging uh, them to rebel by saying we will support you because it, it often doesn't happen, right? Many people have rebelled believing the U.S. is going to help them and that help didn't come. Unless you avoid it. So, if you want to not incentivize that, that's the first thing. The second, you can manage it. You can manage the process. There are lots of ideas. Humanitarian organizations have ideas. You can help the local countries better in a more sustained way and signal to them that we're not going to just come and leave. Jordan has managed the aid that they received far better than Lebanon, which really can't make a decision at all. It just doesn't even really have a real government. Um, and Jordan has fixed its water system through the help of Mercy Corps and other international humanitarian organizations and funding from the EU and other people. It's finally fixed its water problem. It would have taken 10 to 20 billion dollars that they did not have. But now they get it fixed. So there's opportunities for these countries and there are lots of ideas. But you have, we have to be proactive about it. 